Good morning, Salem family. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 5. The story is told of a man and his wife who once purchased what they hoped would be their last home. Now, when the job of, the, of building the house was finished, the man went all throughout the house and he created a punch list to give to the builder. So there's a, a number of issues that were repaired and the man and his wife were not only satisfied with their new home, they were absolutely thrilled. They signed on the many dotted lines, and if you've ever bought a house, you know that there are many dotted lines to sign on when you buy one. But they signed on those dotted lines, and they settled into their new home. However, within just a few weeks of them having moved into the house, windows and doors began to stick. Then cracks appeared in the tile and walls, far more and much larger than normal settling would produce. The house deteriorated at a startling pace. Something was very, very wrong. So the man hires an engineer to come and study the problem, and his investigation uncovers a terrible secret. Old topographical maps revealed that the house had been constructed over a ravine. The developer had filled it in, but apparently water continued to run underneath the house, carrying minute amounts of soil with it. Everything looked perfect on the outside, while deep down the earth eroded away. Eventually, the strain on the slab proved to be too much, and it cracked with devastating results. The house could not be repaired at all, and it was a complete loss. Now, all throughout Scripture, we see examples of people who were put into positions of leadership and positions of authority, yet their integrity could not keep them there. There's water under the house of their lives. There's erosion that's taking place that is not going to hold up the weight of the position that they have taken on. However, there are signs that will show the integrity of the foundation of a person. Uh, In the case of a house, um, like the one I just talked about, time is going to let you know about the integrity of the structure itself. So if the house is built on a firm foundation, you're not going to see visual signs that you would if there was a problem with the foundation of that house. But it's the same way with a person's life. Over time, outward signs are going to appear to show you if there's problems with the foundation of a person's life. Now, we've been studying the book of Nehemiah, and and just as a way of quick recap, we have studied all the way up through the middle of chapter 5. So chapters 1 and 2 tell us what takes place leading up to the start of the building of the wall. Then you get to chapters 3 and 4, and they outline the actual building of the wall and who was involved in the building of that wall. And, And we see there some of the outside opposition that starts to come in as the people are trying to rebuild. Now, last week we started looking at chapter 5 where Nehemiah has to deal with the sinful oppression of some of the people. He handles that situation with strength. We looked at the fact that he handles it it with with grace, with love, and with intentionality. This week we get a behind-the-scenes look at the integrity of Nehemiah. We see today that uh, we see signs today that show us that Nehemiah's foundation is secure. It is firm. There's no water running under the house. Specifically, we see integrity in the way Nehemiah handles his finances and the way that he lives a generous life. Okay, so let's jump right in here. Chapter 5 of Nehemiah, we're going to read verses 14 through 19 together. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them uh, for their daily ration 40 shekels of silver. Even their their servants lorded it over the people. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work on this wall, and we acquired no land. And all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. And now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every 10 days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor, because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, O my God, all that I have done for this people. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, as we approach your word today, 
I pray we do so with humility, understanding that, uh, that, Father, we only understand it because you reveal your word to us. Father, I pray that we do find clarity in what you have left for us here today, but then also, Father, not just clarity, I pray, I pray that we find application to where we see how what you say here in Nehemiah applies to us. Our Father, we love you, and we thank you for the love that you have for us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we move through this, I want you to hold on to <clears throat> this, this key to the whole passage, okay? It's right here. Here's the key to this passage of Scripture. Nehemiah was a man of integrity. And how, we, how do we know? Well, he lived a life of generosity. So Nehemiah was a man of integrity, and the way we know that is because of the way he lived a life of generosity. Now, let's, let's work to break this apart for just a few moments here, okay? I want to look at these verses in Nehemiah chapter 5, and I want for us to see the examples of integrity and see the examples of generosity in the life of Nehemiah. And the first example that we see here is that Nehemiah did not use his expense account for personal household expenses. Uh, verse 14 there says, Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. Now, sometimes for a person who is in a position of leadership, there are certain benefits that come with being that leader. So I think about uh, maybe a, a CEO of a company or organization and that CEO is given an expense account, or maybe they're given a car to drive, or maybe they're given a, a house to live in. And evidently, that's not a new trend. It's not something that's just been taking place over the last, um, well, during my lifetime or maybe your lifetime. It, it, it's pretty clear that that's something that has been taking place since even before the days of Nehemiah, where we are right here in God's Word, studying today. Verse 14 here makes it very clear that Nehemiah had an expense account at his disposal, and specifically that account was there for food. However, Nehemiah chose to pay for his own personal expenses out of his own pocket. Now, I can imagine when, when Nehemiah first arrived in Jerusalem, him looking around at the state of the people, and, and seeing that they're not just in physical danger, they are in, in, in financial danger. And Nehemiah, at some point, made the decision that he would pay for any and all expenses that arose on his account. Or anything that, 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 that might would have been taken care of before by the people, a tax or whatever, he would take care of those things. We see an example here of integrity. We see an example of generosity in Nehemiah. Here's the second example that we see. That is that Nehemiah did not exploit the people in any way. He didn't exploit the people in any way. Verse 15, the former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them their, da their daily ration, 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. Now we're going to come back to that statement because of the fear of God here in just a few moments. But let's talk about how he did not exploit the people in, in any way whatsoever. Uh, we read a verse like this, and um, the weight of this financial burden is, is kind of lost on us. Forty shekels of silver. It's kind of lost on us. Um, he, he, Nehemiah uses those words. It's a daily ration of 40 shekels of silver. And it would be easy for us to think, okay, well, I bet he's talking about something similar to maybe $40 a day for us. In reality, 40 shekels is more like 400 plus dollars a day. It can be a lot of, of money. Now, the average person in biblical times would have worked hard to earn 40 shekels of, of silver. It's likely that 40 shekels of silver would have taken, taken weeks or even months for some people to earn. Here's the reality. The governors before Nehemiah were requiring a large amount of money from the people, and it was sucking the people dry because they had very little, little to, money to give in, in the first place. Nehemiah determined that he was not going to exploit the people. To exploit means that you are sucking everything that you can out of a person. Nehemiah knew that he was there for another reason. 
He's not there to lord over the people. He's not, he's not there to take advantage of them. He is there to lead the people. Next, in, in talking about these examples of integrity and talking about an example of generosity, we see Nehemiah actively participated in the rebuilding of the wall. He actively participated in the rebuilding of the wall. Verse 16, I also persevered in the work of this wall, or on this wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Now, there's a statement right there in the middle, and it kind of makes you pause. Like, what's he talking about here? He says, and we acquired no land. One of the goals of governors, of, 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 of officials in general, would be to acquire as much land as possible. The more land you have, the more affluence you have. Um, the, the more land you have, the greater your name. The more land you have, the greater your wealth. But Nehemiah is not there to gain in wealth. He's not there to gain in affluence. He's not there to gain even in influence. He's got another purpose in being there. We see that in the first part of this verse. I also persevered in the work on this wall. Even my servants were gathered there for the work. Folks, in this, Nehemiah shows the difference between a boss and a leader. A boss watches, watches his employees work, and he doesn't stoop to do jobs that are beneath him. A leader leads by example and is willing to do whatever is necessary to get the job done. You've probably seen at some point um, maybe a graphic of some kind where, where you get a group of people, and, and you can see that here's the goal, here's where they want to get to, and there's somebody behind, and it's like they're pushing them, trying to get them there. But then you see another graphic where there's the same body of, of, of people, but there's a person walking in front of them, and he's saying, come on, let's go together. Okay, that's the difference between a boss and a leader. A boss pushes, a leader gathers you and moves you forward. That's Nehemiah. At some point, there's a chance that you have seen both the boss and the leader. And you've seen that people are more likely to follow a true leader. They're going to follow somebody who's willing to get their hands dirty, digging in the mud to build a wall with you. They may not be the most skilled. That leader may not be the most skilled at doing the job. Right? But, but, but you can tell that they care more about you as an individual and about glorifying God than they do about putting money in their own pockets. Nehemiah was an active participant in the work, and in seeing, it, seeing that here, we see that he's an example for integrity, for generosity, of giving of himself. Next is an example. We see Nehemiah shared what he had with others. He shared what he had with others. Verse 17, there, uh, excuse me, moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now, what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every 10 days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor, because the service was too heavy on the people. Now, can you imagine feeding 150 men every single day? That is a whole lot of food. And we read here that it all came at Nehemiah's expense, out of his own pocket, Every single day they ate one ox and six sheep and birds, and every 10 days they had to restock an abundance of wines. what we find right there. And I thought about trying to figure out what, what's the worth of one ox, and what's the worth of six sheep and, and birds? What's the worth of, of, of an abundance of wine? But I decided not to, because the point that's being made here is this. Nehemiah made a conscious decision to be generous, no matter what it cost. He chose to share what he had with other people around him. Now, by the way, at the beginning of verse 17 there, we see who Nehemiah invited to his table. It's not just the officials. It wasn't just the, one, the, the, the who's who of Jerusalem society. It's the Jews and the officials. It appears as if there's all manner of people from all walks of life invited to the table to eat. You see, Nehemiah wasn't just generous. He was well aware of the value that all men have, and he invited anyone to come to his table and eat. Last week, we talked about the oppression that was taking place from those with privilege against those without. And I can imagine the table of Nehemiah having a place for everyone, no matter of their status in society. 
But then last, as we look at the example of integrity and generosity in Nehemiah, we see that he did what he did only to please the Lord. He did what he did only to please the Lord. And there's, there's two clues for this. The first one comes at the end of verse 15, where Nehemiah talks about not requiring a heavy tax on the people. And he, and he says that he does this, he doesn't require this heavy tax because of the fear of God. The second clue we have comes in verse 19, and it's in the form of a prayer. Remember, Nehemiah is famous for his quick yet passionate prayers. He says, remember for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Nehemiah had a reverence and an awe of God that drastically affected the way that he lived his entire life. His example was clear. Not only here in this passage, but if you look all throughout the book of, of Nehemiah, you see that his goal was to do what he did only to please the Lord. That was his goal. That was his, his aim in life. He chose the path of humility. He chose the path of integrity. He chose the path of generosity over the path of self-glorification. I want to talk for just a few moments here about generosity because that's exactly what we see in Nehemiah. We see him living a life of generosity in humility and with integrity, giving of himself to other people. That's what living a life of generosity means. So let's talk about that for just a couple of moments. I believe that there's three types of Christians when it comes to money, when it comes to their resources. I think there's some who are stingy in their giving, and in fact, they see their tithe as only a duty to fulfill, and they, then they extravagantly uh, spend the rest of their money on everything from bills to vacations with no other thought that God might be asking for something more or something different. This is just a, a duty that I carry out. There's others who give so extravagantly to the church or to other people or to organizations that they struggle to pay their bills every month. And in fact, some, some months their bills go unpaid because they have given out so much. This is the person who has no plan. They just kind of fly through life by the seat of their pants. And I would, I would argue, and I believe Scripture supports, that the third type of giving Christian is the sweet spot of the spectrum. This is the Christian who has been freed from worshiping money as their security blanket, and they've transferred that trust over to God. This person has quit worshiping money, and they've started worshiping God, and he has become their beauty, and he has become their security. A phrase that I heard some time ago, and I have no idea who said it first, but it's, it's this. God doesn't want to be tipped. He wants to be worshipped. God doesn't want to be tipped. He wants to be worshipped. You know, you think about somebody who tips, they go into a restaurant and they tip a waiter. They tip a waitress. Right? But that's not God. God, is, God could care less about our tip. He wants to be worshipped. What I believe that Nehemiah knew about money and that what Nehemiah knew about the resources that he had was that those things didn't matter as much as worshiping God mattered. I believe Nehemiah knew that it was a more beautiful thing for him to treat others with love and respect and give consistently and sacrificially than for him to have a whole bunch of money in his bank account. I think about what's taking place with COVID-19 right now and um, there's people all around who are hurting and they're looking for answers. I believe there's many of those people who are looking for answers from Christians. This past week, I was on a Zoom call with, with many of our missionaries from our church. And uh, one of the missionary couples that was on there was Dave and Megan Guevara. And, and David, Me David Guevara made the comment that when the suffering and the hunger and the riots started taking place in Saguatapeque, Honduras, that, that the government officials actually wondered how long it would take the Christians to step up and help. And so now they have stepped up in a very big way, and the community, entire communities, are being drastically changed by the radical generosity of the Christians. In our own city of Winston-Salem, there's massive needs, and I believe that there are people who are wondering how the Christians are going to step up and take action to help. If we really believe the gospel, and if we truly value every human being who is created in God's image, and if we truly have been radically changed by the life that we have found in Jesus, then what kind of response will we have when others are hurting around us? 
Church, now is not the time to worship ourselves. It's not the time to worship our money. It's not the time to worship our houses or the resources that we have been given. Now is the time to worship our great God. And one of the ways that worship is tangibly seen is in how we love other people around us. Here's an example of, of, of action that we as members of Salem Baptist Church can take right now to help meet the needs of those around us. Uh, we as a church support the Salem Pregnancy Center. It's located right here in Winston-Salem, and they are doing a fantastic job of ministering to girls and women who are pregnant. And, and in fact, here's what they say on their website about the work that they do. Salem Pregnancy is a safe refuge for hurting women who find themselves in an unplanned pregnancy. We listen to their fears, questions, and personal struggles with compassion and offer real solutions to their situation. We provide them with factual information so that they can make informed decisions about their next choice. All of our services are free because of the generous support of people like you. Now, the Salem Pregnancy Center is tangibly making a difference in our community, and they're shining the light of the gospel into a spiritually dark place. Typically, at this time of the year, they do a baby bottle campaign to help raise funds that they need in order to minister well. But this year, the baby bottle campaign cannot take place as normal simply because of the social distancing that's taking place. So here's what we've done. We have set up a specific link where you can go online and you can give toward the ministry of the Pregnancy Center. And you can find that link on Salem's Facebook page or in the sermon recap email that's going to come to you here in just a little while. We have felt led this week for us as a church to raise $2,000 for the Salem Pregnancy Center. If all you can do is, is give um, $10, then that's great. If you can give $100, then that's, that's fantastic. But I want to challenge you to today, if you're at all able to do so, go online and give towards the Salem Pregnancy Center. I believe we can blow that $2,000 out of the water. I think we can do much more than $2,000. But folks, this is a tangible way that we can love and we can minister to others right now. So let's do it. Let's do it together. I think about the example of integrity, the example of generosity from Nehemiah. And I think about the fact that he could have done the very same thing that other governor or government officials did. Right? He, he could have used his influence to build a name and to build a wealth for himself. Many commentators on this passage that I read this week agree that it would have not phased the people if Nehemiah did this, simply because that was the cultural norm. That's what people did. They took advantage of those underneath them. It was natural for the leaders who had some level of privilege to take advantage of their position, but Nehemiah chose to put the good of other people over his own good. He chose to put the good of others over his own good. I can think of um, someone else who chose to do the very same thing. Someone who put the needs of other people over his own. If you go back and you look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, the Apostle Paul is addressing the New Testament church in Philippi, and here's what he has to say. So if there's any encouragement in Christ any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. In other words, what he's doing here is he's challenging the church to be unified. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Now, that sounds really familiar, doesn't it? Kind of sounds like Nehemiah. Not being selfish, being humble, watching out for other people. Paul continues, verse 5, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
Now wait just a second. I can understand Nehemiah being generous with his life. Right? I, I could see Nehemiah being humble and caring for others and sacrificing himself for the good of others. But Jesus, he's the son of God. He, he's deity. Why would, why would he do this? It's because he knew that there is nothing more important in this world than humbling yourself before God and honoring and obeying God. And what we find next here in this passage is that God, in turn, honors Jesus. Verse 9, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now let me see if I can tie all of this together for us here this morning, okay? Nehemiah saw others as more important than himself, even though they were not necessarily more important than he was. Jesus saw others as more important than himself, even though they weren't. Nehemiah had every opportunity to exploit people for his own gain, but he didn't take it. Jesus had every opportunity to exploit people for his own gain, but he didn't do it. Nehemiah chose to give of himself to other people constantly. Jesus chose to give of himself to others constantly. And Nehemiah didn't just facilitate the plan of God or lead in the plan of God. He actively engaged in the plan of God. Jesus didn't just facilitate the plan of God or say, here's how it's supposed to take place. He chose to actively engage in the plan of God. Nehemiah chose to live a life of radical generosity, thereby pointing people to the goodness of God by doing so. Jesus likewise chose to live a life of rad radical generosity, giving of something much more important than money. Jesus gave himself, thereby pointing people to the goodness of God. Nehemiah only had one aim in life, one goal, and that was to honor and obey God. Whatever God asked Nehemiah to do, he did it. In fact, there's not a single time all throughout the, the book of Nehemiah where we can see that we have evidence of Nehemiah disobeying God in any way. Jesus had only one aim in his life, and that was to honor and obey God. Every single thing God asked Jesus to do, he did it. Now, I'm not saying that Nehemiah was perfect. Jesus was, but Nehemiah was not but in both Nehemiah and Jesus, we see the example that we are to look to for humility and for integrity and for generosity. All right, so let's think about us here for just a moment. How are our lives mimicking the lives of Nehemiah and Jesus? How are, or excuse me, are, are, are we as, as men and women and boys and, and girls of integrity are we, are we men and women, boys of in, and girls of integrity and, and high character? Are we radically generous with the finances that God has given us, the resources that God has blessed us with? Are we actively engaged in the plan of God rather than just living according to whatever we want to do? What is our aim? What is our goal in life? Is that goal the same as both Nehemiah and Jesus, where they had the goal of honoring and, and glorifying, obeying God above everything else? And the last question that kind of goes with this is this. Who or what are we worshiping today? Are we worshiping ourselves or are we worshiping God? Are we worshiping money or are we worshiping the God who has blessed us with that money to use for his glory and our good? I think this passage gives us a great opportunity to take an inward look at ourselves and say, where am I at in this? Am I living a life of integrity? Am I living a life that honors God? Am I living a life of generosity, of giving of myself in everything from energy to resources to, yes, finances, but am I giving of myself the way that we see in this example of Nehemiah and of Jesus? In closing, I want to leave you with this verse from, from Acts chapter 20, verse 24. Paul says, But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself. 
If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. What Paul is saying there is that I I don't have anything in this life that is worth comparing to the gospel, that is worth comparing to the life that I can live in Jesus Christ. My, My goal, my aim in life is to finish my course and the ministry that I've received from Jesus My goal and my aim in life is for the gospel to go out so I can testify to the gospel of what Jesus has done inside of me. May our lives be just like that. Folks, where we don't look at us and say, look at how great I am. Look at the wealth that I have accumulated for myself. Look at all the things that I have done in life. But rather, we spend our lives with a much higher purpose, a greater purpose, of giving. I want to challenge you to think about, am I a person of integrity and am I honoring and obeying God? Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for uh, this passage in Nehemiah that reminds us of the radical generosity of Jesus. Now, Jesus, by all human standards, um, didn't have much. He was was virtually homeless during his time of ministry. Uh, Father, he he didn't have much money to show off and to buy a lot of people's stuff. Oh, but Father, he gave of himself. Nehemiah, the same way, and we don't know exactly what level of wealth Nehemiah would have had. But Father, we see him giving of himself, understanding that what you have called him to do is much greater and has much more purpose than anything that, any wealth that he can accumulate for himself or any amount of land or a name. Father, may we live the same way, lives of humility, putting Jesus first in our lives. And then Father, we ask that you bless that. That, Father, people come to a saving knowledge of your son, Jesus, because of the life that they see us live. Father, we want to live so other people see you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.